try that again. All right, now here I am. Okay, so as I was saying, um, I'm Pastor Jen, so whether you're joining us from home or away, perhaps you're on vacation, or you're here in person, we're so glad you are here today. So I have an opener that I'd like to share from Jenny Ray Armstrong. She writes, when my brother was little, he was obsessed with superheroes. His favorite was He-Man, an 80s cartoon where wimpy Prince Adam, a simple blonde page boy, transformed into an armor-clad muscle man when evil threatened the kingdom. Anybody watch He-Man? I used to. And guess what? His female counterpart? She-Ra. Yeah. Okay. Now, one of the complications of being a superhero, especially a secret one, is figuring out how to change into your super self without giving away your secret identity. Superman had telephone booths and Batman, Batman had the Batcave, but poor Prince Adam had to pretend to be a coward and run away so he could find a private place to unsheathe his magical sword and yell, I have the power! Yes, that's right. His words combined with his actions transformed him into He-Man, and He-Man was a force to be reckoned with. We certainly don't base our theology on superhero cartoons, but like Prince Adam, our words have power. They don't have magical, mystical power like some Christian and secular self-help books would say. We can't just strike a power pose, repeat an affirmation like, I have the power, and become the masters of the universe, bending it to our will. But words are powerful tools that can be used for great evil or great good. Proverbs 12, 18 says, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. That's just the start of what the Bible has to say about how we wield our words. So this is a great day to worship. Every day is a great day to worship. Let's do that now. Thanks, church. Good morning, CV Free. It's great to be back. See all your smiling faces again. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord this morning. When all I see is a mountain, you see 
a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, that belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. If you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus is nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see my beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see an empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, that'll be long to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, that belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. You're seeing a lot of me this morning. So Pastors John and Kathy are celebrating the graduation of their daughter this weekend. So I am filling in. And I am excited to be able to bring you today's announcements because it's actually a time of celebration. So I'll point out the Connect cards. You have the QR code on the back of the seats in front of you and also on the screen. So you can go online and complete it or you have the hard copies in the backs of the seats. But this morning is a great time to celebrate that, for example, our Helping Hands team hosted Cram the Cruiser yesterday at Norwich PD. That was so cool. And I love, I drove by and I, I stopped in briefly. The PD even like turned on the lights on the back of the cruiser and opened the tailgate and just grabbed extra attention from people. 
it's a really cool partnership, and I thank you so much. The Helping Hands team was here today assembling all those goodies to be distributed this Thursday at Helping Hands. You are appreciated. That's a really cool way to be able to support our community, and it's possible because of you and the support you give through serving. Our prom closet, we, last I knew, we're up to 11 dresses and one suit jacket that went out to young ladies and a gentleman who were in need of a beautiful um, dress and, and, of course, the suit jacket for the prom experience. And I'm so grateful for that team who comes and makes this possible. Uh, Lexi even brought some dresses to the high school this week here in Norwich and was able to give one to a young lady at school. It's just so awesome. And if I'm not and mistaken, their goal was 10, right? Yeah, the goal was 10. There you go. So the goal was reached <laughs> and even exceeded. And we actually got a package in the mail this week of a couple of, I believe, their dresses that somebody sent to us through Amazon. So <laughs> I'm like, that's cool. Yeah, so we'll add those to the prom closet. And a final shout out to our visitation and nursing home teams. These teams are committed to caring for people in our church community and beyond. You are appreciated. Like, oh, I'm so grateful this morning for those of you who do serve. So thank you. Thank you for serving. Yeah, amen to that. All right. Yeah, that, that's a big, good kaboom, and thanks. Awesome. All right, so let's get back to worship. All right, everyone. As we come into this next song, The Lion and the Lamb, May we recall Revelation 5, 6, and 5, 9. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And from verse 9... And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. So please remember, our God is the Lion of Judah. He's fighting all our battles. He is both the lion and the lamb. He is here to set us free. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing the next song. Every knee will bow 
just in our time and our hearts to a time of prayer, a time of thanksgiving. I just want to remind you that you're welcome to come forward. We have the, the prayer rails. You're welcome to come up and pray. And if you feel more comfortable praying at your seat, that's totally fine. Let's take some time to just reflect upon things this, today. And You know, the enemy's been hard at work at finding ways to beat people down and discourage them. And it seems to be really hard at work lately. I know a handful of people that are, that are seeing that. But as we've said, already sang this morning, the battle belongs to the Lord. And he is our lion that protects us, as Joyce said earlier. So let's take some time today as we come to a prayer just thanking him for that. And you can come forward during this song with your gifts, your tithes, your offerings. We've got the baskets in the front. We also have the... the boxes in the back and you can do it virtually on your phone if you'd like For those watching at home you can also mail it um, but let's just come with a thankful heart just thanking the Lord for for taking on those battles and for being there with us as we're fighting through these storms He's so good Let's sing this morning. Take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on. 
altar again. Set me on fire. Set me on fire. Take all I have in these hands and multiply. God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire. Set me on fire. Thank you, Father, for walking with us every day. For going to battle for us every day. Standing tall with us. Celebrating with us when things go well and when we're excited about things. Crying with us as we're struggling carrying us, Father, when we don't think we can walk any further. 
just being there with us. No matter what the struggle, no matter what the pain, being there with us. You're so good. And Father, we've seen so many different ways that the enemy's tried to discourage us, to harm us. Ways that he's put things in our path, Father, that may have seemed too difficult if it wasn't for you. And Father, I pray for if there's anybody here, or if there's anybody at home who's struggling with that right now, Lord, that you come alongside them. Because we know that when we trust you, we give it to you, that, Father, you'll do amazing things. And, Lord, I, found, I, I, I've, I have found out firsthand that the answers we're looking for aren't always your answers, Father. But you always have our best in mind. And that, Father, you will do amazing things for your glory. And that's all that we ask. So, Father, we follow you. We trust you. We put it in your hands. For the battle belongs to you. Father, Joyce's words were so right on. And she said that you are that lion who defends, protects us, and fights for us. So, Father, as the song said, we come to you now, arms wide open. Just rain your spirit down upon this building. Fill us up, Father. For you are so good. And Father, we come to you this morning with our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. Just another way, Father, to thank you. And Lord, we pray, as the song says, take all that is in those baskets and multiply them for your glory. Use these gifts, these tithes, and these offerings to reach our community for you. And to continue to further that mission. To make that Christ connection. So that those out there who are lost, who are struggling, who are facing things that just seem so impossible. That Father, you may put us in their path. You may make it possible for us, Lord, to be there. And show them that they can get through this. And there is nothing that they've done that stops the love that you have for every one of them and every one of us here and watching at home. You're a good Father. So Father, rain your spirit down here. Join us here, Father. Be blessed in this time. As Pastor Jen comes and gives your message, Lord, speak through Pastor Jen this morning. And just guide her words. And open our hearts and our minds, Father, to just absorb your words. That we may grow deeper in our relationship with you. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and your love. And all you do for us every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Funny story. Yeah. The other day I was walking uh, downtown and I literally was just going, boom, rah, boom, boom. <laughs>
you Why were in my head. Because nice of that. because of the bumper <laughs> video at church. Love <laughs> it. That's great. All right, awesome. So it is another day in the series of Jesus Interrupted, and I'm excited. I'm excited to be able to talk about the fact that Jesus was that someone, excuse me, someone greater, that someone greater who we never could have imagined would come. Matthew 3.11b tells us that, that Jesus interrupted many people's preconceived notions and plans about salvation, life. He changed everything. And aren't we so glad? Now, I want to encourage you, feel free to open up your YouVersion Bible app and uh, follow along in the sermon notes today, or maybe you have your hard copy Bible. That's a possibility as well. We do have a slide with the QR code for the YouVersion Bible app if you choose to use that. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we explored some connections with the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because remember, they are connected. There is intertwining there. And God orchestrated that from the beginning. Remember that we dove into the woman who had been afflicted with a physical illness for 12 years, that she was dealing with that pain, that suffering, that isolation. But in her boldness in interrupting Jesus, she was literally healed. Her whole life changed. And that interruption not only changed her life, but gave her an incredible testimony to be able to share with others. This week, we're going to continue in that same vein, showing an overlap, an interconnection between the Old Testament and the New. You know, Jesus did not interrupt God's plan when he came into being in the New Testament. God taking on human form in Jesus was planned from God's perspective. That was part of what was going to come. He knew that this part of the plan would occur. However, Jesus was certainly an interruption for those religious leaders who were not anticipating the Messiah the way that he came. The Apostle John, one of the 12 disciples who was closest to Jesus, knew this truth. John knew that Jesus was not a mere interruption to be ignored or corrected. Instead, Jesus was that someone greater. And of course, John the Apostle, not the same as John the Baptist, but interestingly enough, there are intertwinings with their truths today that I'm going to share. He was, in fact, that light shining into the dark places. John 1, verses 1 through 14, tell us that Christ is the eternal word from the beginning and all the way to the end. In the beginning, the word Jesus already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word, Jesus, gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. This light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Isn't that encouraging? God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about that light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth. Praise God, right? That's a bit tricky as an adult. Not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word Jesus became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only son. You know, it's interesting. If only the religious leaders had actually been paying attention to what they were teaching the Jewish people, they would have known that Jesus was who he said he was. There's irony in that, right? That, that they're the ones who are teaching the truth of scripture, 
But yet when scripture becomes embodied in the form of Jesus Christ, they don't recognize it and they reject him. Ah, how sad. The religious leaders were too caught up in their their spirit of religion to realize the words they had been teaching the whole time were paving the way for Jesus to come. Wake up. He has arrived. The very same Jesus by whom they felt threatened and would ultimately crucify. They missed it. They missed the mark. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3 together to read about John the Baptist who John the Apostle was writing about. John prepared the way. God used him to set the milestones and to call out those religious teachers, those leaders, to say, you must recognize this Jesus. Beginning with chapter 3, In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah, that's Old Testament, was speaking about John when he said he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. He was a bit of an odd duck, even in his time, those things were strange. People from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees, those are religious leaders, coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. He called them out. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed. Who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Show the fruit. Don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. We're all set. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. There's an expectation for us, isn't there, as believers? We're not supposed to just be saved and then never grow, never share. I baptize, John says, with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. Someone is going to come interrupt so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be a slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. There's strength in those words. And they should compel us to action, to recognize the hard truth of what happens, we're either on one side or the other. After this stern warning and dose of truth, Scripture describes the baptism of Jesus to further show Jesus' identity according to the plan that God had laid out. In verse 13, then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. Like, I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? Like, I'm not good enough to be doing this. But Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry on all that God requires. The plan had been laid out. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. This exchange is a powerful picture of God's plan. John the Baptist heard from God and was able to recognize Jesus. God's plan for someone greater was happening just as God said it would and just as John had documented, just as John the Baptist had said it would. How sad for those religious leaders that they merely saw Jesus as an interruption, a disturbance, an obstacle to their expectations. 
Their unfortunate response was to complain and fight against Jesus. Ultimately, even the religious leader's response was not an interruption for God, though. He knew their free will would take them down this path of rejection. And even sending Jesus to the cross, which ended up being an integral part of the plan. It had to play out that way in order for redemption to come to all of us. However, it is encouraging to consider one story of a Pharisee who took a different path, Nicodemus. He changed course. He didn't just follow his peers. Nicodemus paid attention to what he was seeing and hearing, and he was able to break free from the jaded influence of his peers in order to truly seek Jesus for himself. Now, before we go to the scriptural account of Nicodemus and and we follow his story, which is a little scandalous because it happened in the dark, so no one else would know that he was going out of line of his peers and what they would have wanted. I'd like to have us think about the fact that peer pressure is a real thing. Peer pressure is very real, and not just for young people. Peer pressure happens to older people as well. Adults can fall into a trap of peer pressure. Now, sometimes peer pressure can be positive, right? We can pressure each other to do positive things. There's an accountability factor there that can be really beneficial. But other times, we can find ourselves afraid to be different, afraid to go against the current. We end up just following the flow and letting the flow take us to whatever destination our peers decide. You may be familiar with The Chosen. If you're not, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, Its opener captures this concept really well. In it, there's a video illustration of a bunch of fish in a school going in directions at the same time. But then there's one fish that's different from the rest, and that fish starts to go in a different direction, different from his or her peers. And so we think about this idea of how important it is for us to break free from the flow of the world, to not accept it. That's what Nicodemus did. That's what we're supposed to be encouraged to do. That's what John the Baptist was encouraging those religious leaders and anyone who would listen to do. In fact, Romans 12, 2, when Paul writes, don't copy, do you know this one? You should. Like, this is one of those life verses. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. By what? Changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It's different, but it's good. It's always good. Put another way by an unknown author, don't be afraid of being different. In fact, be afraid of being like everyone else. I love that. Don't be afraid of being different. Be afraid of being like everyone else. What about everyone else? When they're doing wrong things, do we really want to be like them just for the sake of comfort and momentary security? No. Be different. That's tough. That's tough for young people, and guess what? It's tough for adults, too but it captures the essence of who Nicodemus was and who we are called to be 2,000 years later. We must be able to seek and find truth as opposed to being told what to believe and then simply accepting it. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 17, talk about this interaction with Nicodemus, and I'm going to paraphrase some parts, but we think about this whole idea that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, So he was one of these religious leaders, but he wasn't like the others. He wasn't like his peers. We know this because in verse 2, we write, we read from John who writes, after dark one evening, Nicodemus snuck away and he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, 
We all know. We all know. I love that. Okay, so even those of my peers who hate you and want you gone know that God has sent you to teach us. That's a really powerful truth, right? Their intimidation of him was exactly because they knew who he was. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. There's no denying it, Jesus. It is so important to pick up on this fact. Now, Nicodemus wasn't quite as brave as the woman who broke through the crowd and reached out for Jesus, where everybody could see her. But he was bold, even though he came at night. However, because of his willingness to do his own research and go right to the source, he would come out of the spiritual darkness and into the light. That would be his experience. Jesus replied to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Like, wah! Nope, that's not how it works, right? Right? Thank you, thank you, Jesus. And so he replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and the spirit. Baptism and the Holy Spirit coming, that connection. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born, to get born again. The wind blows wherever it wants. I love this. Just as you hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit, we know God is real. Just as we know the, the wind is real, we know the air we breathe is real, God is real. And Nicodemus, of course, wanted to know how this is possible. And Jesus is like, you've been teaching about it for all this time. How do you not know? The scriptures that you've been teaching everybody they're real. I'm here. That's what it's all about. I'm paraphrasing, as I mentioned. And so in verse 11, he writes, I assure you, we will tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. There will be people who deny. It's so sad. But ultimately, the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses, this is verse 14, as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Now, that was a prophecy from Numbers. And I'm excited to go there with you today, but let's not forget the essence of John 3, 16, 17. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but what? Have eternal life. You know it. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. That was his purpose. And so we think about this whole idea that there is a way out have you ever seen, it's got to be in an Indiana Jones movie, there are multiple movies where they're on a boat, right? It's going down the river. Everybody thinks that this is exactly where they should be. The current's taking them along. They're going with the flow. Life's good. And then all of a sudden, somebody looks up, right, from the rest of the group, looks up and says, <gasps> We're about to go over the waterfall. You've seen it, right? And all of a sudden, it's this hurried, frenzied, ah, we're all going to die. And everybody's trying to stop the boat from going with the flow over the waterfall because it's certain death. And then somebody jumps out, jumps out of the boat, and has to make the decision, I'm not going to go over that waterfall and have certain death. I am going to pick a different path. I'm going to jump out of this boat. I'm going to fight the current, swim over. We know there's a tree branch, right? There's got to be. There's always a tree that's fallen into the water just close enough that the determined actor or actress can grab it and pull him or herself up to safety. But that person had to make a deliberate decision to go against the flow, to do something different, to say, you know what, I'd rather be in that raging water and take the chance that I can 
fight my way over to safety than just stay in the boat with the rest of you and die. Isn't it interesting? We think about how it's not an easy step to jump into the water, but it's necessary if life is the desired outcome. Jesus mentioned an interesting Old Testament account about eternal life to Nicodemus when they were talking. You may have caught it. It's kind of an odd account from history where the Lord actually brought poisonous snakes upon the people because they were complaining so much. And this is what happened in Numbers 21, 4 through 9. Then the people of Israel sent out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? They complained. There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. Yeah, there was something to eat. That's You had manna. So it's like, again, uh, exaggerations and negativity existed in the beginning of time just as they do today. People haven't changed all that much in some ways. And so the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have, been, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. We're sorry. And so Moses prayed for the people. And then the Lord told him this fascinating instruction. Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten, so interesting that they still had to be bitten, will live if they simply look at it. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake, because they followed his instructions, could look, in fact, at the bronze snake and be healed. So that's an interesting account, but I think it's important to bring this together. So as Jesus is telling Nicodemus about looking and living, I'd like to remind us, you might actually recognize this image. It's called a caduceus, and we have a a picture of it for you where there is a snake, in fact, wrapped around a pole. And as we see this image, we may be reminded of something that we've seen on the side of an ambulance or something that we've seen in a doctor's office. It is the caduceus, and I think our tech team is scrambling to try to find this image I'm describing, and I'm sure they will, so that's fine. I'll continue while they look. Now, some may say this symbol is actually attributed to the Greek god Hermes, especially when it's two snakes wrapped around a pole. He was the messenger god. But the correlation between Numbers 21 and the medical profession is quite definitive as I see it. This whole concept of look to this symbol and live. Look to this symbol and live. Nicodemus knew from Jesus' teaching about what had happened with Moses and the caduceus, that snake wrapped around the pole. And Jesus knew what he would be, in fact, doing as he would be put up on a pole of sorts as a sacrifice. But what would be the instruction? Look and live. That's the ultimate message being willing to step back from the complaining, as was the case with the Israelites, and the pressure of our peers, to be willing to look up, look out, and see the path we are on. Is it one of death, where we are about to crash over a waterfall or step on a trap that the enemy has set for us? If so, it's not too late. That nighttime interruption from Nicodemus changed his entire life. Even though he did not become as bold in sharing his decision, his testimony as the woman who experienced healing did, we can track his experience through the rest of the book of John and see powerful actions that he took in defense of Jesus. In John chapter 7, Nicodemus openly questioned his peers 
the other Pharisees as they sought to convict Jesus without a trial. And then in John chapter 19, we read about Nicodemus actually bringing Joseph of Arimathea 75 pounds of herbs and ointment to honor Jesus in his burial. Something changed that night for Nicodemus. He spent time with the Savior, and what seemed like a predestined path was interrupted. Nicodemus sought truth instead of just going with the flow of his peers, and he came out of the darkness into the light. He said, I am not going to just simply conform because my peers say I should. I'm going to seek truth because I need to know what's real. If you haven't yet made a decision to let Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior, I want, to op- I want to offer you the opportunity to do that today. You know, that's something that's really important for us to be able to ask ourselves, all right, you know what? If I was confronted today with the question, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Have you welcomed him into your life? Do you consider him your Savior? Have you looked to the cross and made a decision for life? Would the answer be yes? If it would, praise God, that's awesome. If it would not, because you're unsure, I want to encourage you today to ask yourself and to pray, why? Why would you not be able to confidently answer that question with a resounding yes? Are there things that need to be researched? Are there questions that you need to ask other people or God in prayer? What are the barriers? Because here's the thing. There's no better time to go against the flow, to dare to be different than today, than right now. You know my heart for this community. You know that as I see people doing evil things in our community, I simply cannot accept that outcome. That is not who we are. We are better because God is better. And he has great plans for us as individuals, as a church, and as a community. But it's going to take a bunch of people realizing that if we trust the Lord, he will show us the way. And in many circles, that requires us going against the flow, even jumping out of the boat to do something different, to share how God has worked in our lives, or to simply be willing to have a conversation and share our own testimony. There's something beautiful about being able to say, you know what, the old self is gone, the new has come. Just yesterday, just this morning, there may have been things that happened that you wish hadn't. Words you said that you wish you hadn't said, actions you took that you wish you hadn't done. It is not too late to ask God to come in and change you entirely. I'm so grateful for that truth. And so let's take some time to reflect during this final song. The prayer rails are here. You you have your seats. You can feel free to reflect on who God is for you. As an individual, and please, I want to encourage you to reach out and ask. We want to be on this journey with you, this journey to find Jesus, this journey to look and live. So let's reflect as we worship. Thank you, Pastor Jen. As we uh, get ready to do this last song, reflect on the words that Pastor Jen had given us. I want to point out to you, and many of you know, that I was recently in the hospital last week, and I really appreciate all of your prayers, um, kind of a scary situation, and uh, wasn't expected. And as I laid in that bed in the hospital, wondering what was coming next, I'll admit to you that I was afraid. 
because I didn't know what the future held for me and what what the, God's plan was and all of this and you know what what that meant uh, moving forward. But I'm an awesome support system, and you know, it was brought to my attention that you know no matter where I feel that fear, God is with me. And we've kind of been talking about that throughout today. But that I have no reason to fear because God's with me. And because I trust him. And so as I was picking the music this week, this song was one that really just hit home for me. And it's really been my uh, go-to, I guess, in the last few weeks as we decide what, what the future holds and... Uh, and, and where we're going to go with, with, uh, with that situation. And the song's called Standing in Your Love. The chorus goes, My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. So let's stand up. Let's worship the Lord. Let's sing. Darkness comes to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken no, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place you hide. I'm not a captain to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. Where we go? My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I. message and it ties in so nicely 
with that verse, Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Church, it takes boldness. You know, the opposite of fear is action, really, because fear tries to debilitate us, to hold us back, to keep us quiet. But the opposite of fear is speaking, is doing, is putting our faith into action. Of course, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and other brothers and sisters who can help guide us in when it's time to speak, when it's time to act. But when that call comes, may we be different. May we be the ones who are willing to jump out of the boat and fight against the current. Not being afraid of being different, but being afraid of being like everyone else. God, I pray that you would go out from this place with us today, that, Lord, you would have us internalize this powerful message that you have brought to us today. Father, I pray away the confines of peer pressure that would try to make us be a certain way. And so often it seems that that way is outside of your will for us, what you would have us think, do, and say. Lord, may we put you first so that you are at the forefront of our minds when the opportunity comes to think and act, that we would do so on your behalf, Father God. I pray that we would be turning to you for the wisdom that we so very much need. And I pray your blessing upon your people who have obviously prioritized you this Sunday morning. Father God, bless them. Keep them close this week and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church.